Hey everyone, uh, welcome to our LinkedIn Live session. We are thrilled to have you join us for an engaging conversation over the next hour. Today, we are honored to have two distinguished panelists with us. First, I'd like to introduce Stacy Litwin Davies. Stacy is the principal of consulting at Cressa, bringing over 30 years of rich experience in managing complex multi regional and global workplace projects. Her work spans across both public and private sectors with a footprint in Canada and Europe. Stacy is not only a leader in her field, but also an expert in change management, as well as workforce and workplace strategy. We also have uh, Jordi Yargez joining us, a seasoned professional with 21 years of experience in the facilities industry, certified in both CFM and SFP. Jordi leads workplace consulting, energy and strategic facilities management across sectors such as hospitality and healthcare. A long-standing employee of Bayer since 2007, he currently resides in Saskatoon, but operates on a global scale as a portfolio ESG sustainability strategy coordinator within a global corporate real estate team. Additionally, Jordi contributes his expertise as the director of communications for, for IFMA. Uh, welcome, Stacy and Jordi, and to our audience. Thank you. So let's dive uh, right into this in, uh, insightful session. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about how we've traditionally used uh, data in the past. In uh, you know, not too distant of past, we used to look to using data to uh, densify workplaces, um, basically to fit the same uh, number of people in less space because usually the business was growing. So you were either uh, merging with other businesses or there was something happening within the organization that basically led to trying to accommodate uh, more people within the existing space. Today though, it's more about reducing wasted underutilized space driven mostly by uh, new emerging hybrid work patterns. Um, what we're finding is, is that it's easy to make that first big cut with little attention to detail. A lot of companies are making uh, cuts you know, between 50 and 60% without hesitation as their lease renewals come up. However, um, with considerably less space, the space that remains becomes a, uh, a focal point. Uh, it needs to fit the needs of those who are actively using the space. And this has become a critical challenge and is one of the two factors driving the success or failure of hybrid working experiences in the office. The other challenge that follows closely behind is actually proactively managing the availability of space. So before we get into the thick of this topic, let's address uh, what we like to say is the elephant in the room, uh, articulating the goal. So when we think about uh, real estate, organizations really need to define what the role real estate will play in their organization. Stacey, you're in front of clients as a consultant every day. Why do you think organizations are struggling with this? And what is the general sentiment in this regard? Well, I think that one of the big stumbling blocks right now is articulating the why around hybrid for each organization. Many organizations have plans now, um, particularly the large enterprise uh, companies have, have a clear hybrid plans. Some of them actually have written policies. But one of the issues seems to be around the why. Why are we doing it the way we're doing it? What is leading us down this path this way? And it seems to be a question that's on a lot of the staff's mind as to why we're doing it this way. Sometimes it's partially because they're not that happy with the, uh, with the plan that's in place. It could be that they're being asked to come back three, maybe even four, five days a week, and they're not really aligned with this plan. Um, and they're asking, why do we need to be back this often? Um, what is the value? Um, I'm being very productive the way I am at home and in the office part of the time. I don't need to be there that much. And the answers that they get back are often rather weak. Sometimes they're very poorly articulated. In many cases, they're not robust. They don't really answer the question as to why we're doing it this way. And that's one of the big stumbling blocks. So companies are sort of getting stuck here with the fact that they have a plan, but their plans aren't working very well because people aren't actually buying into them. And one of the issues about not buying into it now is that they're actually not coming when they're being expected to come. And this sort of more democratic environment is not something that uh, leadership are used to. They're used to a much more 
autocratic environment where if they declare something, this is what is going to happen, it actually does happen. But in our environment now, that isn't the case. It's much more democratic. I would even lean to the point where it's actually anarchistic in a way, because when we think of democracy, we think of something where we actually align on it, on something, we vote on something, we agree on something, and then we all do it. And in the environment that we're in now, it isn't actually that democratic because the decision isn't shared and in some cases not agreed upon. And then you've got a bit of anarchy where there are many individuals who don't buy into it and therefore don't act on the plan that is set in place. So you have this sort of rather difficult environment, a complex environment that's happening. And it's not working for a lot of people because there are those people who are commuting who feel that it's too far a distance, to cost too much money. They don't feel that there's a value. There are women's, uh, women and minorities who feel that they're being left out or there's not some benefit to them. Coming to the office is even more difficult. On the other hand, they're concerned about their career path. We have uh, you know, new, new recruits and we have young people who feel that they're not getting mentored well, coached properly, um, who don't feel that the senior leaders are available to them in the office when they are there. This is the kind of thing that's happening in the workplace right now. It's a very complex situation, not easily resolved. Yeah, it's really it's really interesting. I think uh, just to add to that, you know, when you when you're talking about the why, you hear often, you know, this need to bring people back to the office because they're going to there's a need for them to collaborate more, to build to build relationships and it feels as though, you know, there's an underlying belief that just because you come into the office that this type of activity is actually going to occur. Uh, one of the things that we recently discovered, um, we just actually completed our Q3 benchmark report, uh, actually looking at meeting rooms in particular because of this sentiment that's out there is, uh, yes, meeting rooms are being used by the people that are coming back into the office. But when you you and and they're actually used quite well. So you look at um, just the availability of rooms and just the demand for spaces across all kinds of space um, or sorry room sizes. But when you dig into the specifics around well, how many people are actually in the room, we find or found that seventy five percent of the uh, number of people in the room are just single person occupants. And mm -hmm. so they're going into rooms regardless of the size of the room and are just mm -hmm. basically parking themselves there for mm -hmm. the day, which kind of makes you question, well, you know, why is that actually happening from a behavior point of view, right? So again, it's that thing of there's this, this belief, there's these, you know, reasons that are being given, but it's not really being supported by, uh, by data, either from, you know, the onset of just exploring, like, what do people need, but then now looking at the actual behavior after the fact of you're pushing for people to come back to the office, but you're seeing something completely different when you're looking at, well, what's actually transpiring um, when people actually are coming in, coming into the office. And the other thing to, which you also touched upon was the whole idea of, you know, building relationships, right? I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've heard where people will go into the office, you know, to be mentored or to, you know, to do just that. I read recently, you know, companies that are, um, uh, mandating, you know, new hires to be in the office, you know, every day or, you know, four days a week, you know, which is different from everybody else who might be working hybrid. Uh, and I've experienced this myself, actually, in a company that I worked at years back, where you go into the office and the people that you should be building relationships with are all working remotely. And so it just kind of that thing of not really thinking through what you're asking people to do and really what is actually transpiring within, uh, within the organization. Um, Jordi, do you have anything you want to add to that from a from a um, a, a goals perspective? Yeah, well, basically, basically, well, just to point out, you mentioned uh, uh, I am uh, IFMA's communication director. I'm just acting as communications director for the Saskatchewan chapter here here in in Saskatchewan. But just just to point out that, um, yeah, I th I believe that when at least we moved into the whys because initially at the at the beginning of the pandemic um the reason to come back uh or the was to preserve the the culture of and i believe that this this speech that in many companies is still continuing 
the the preservation of the culture and coming back to the office it's 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 basically not just well i'm i'm working remotely as a, as an example no i'm working remotely if i go to an office and and i'm fully connected with the rest of the organization i enjoy of having virtual coffees with with my my peers all around and i cannot say that after 16 years in the same company i'm working three four days um, a week uh, before the before COVID, going to the office, I'm more disconnected right now than what I was in the past. Uh, but for me now, going to the office, uh, as as we 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 saw we saw in in, in many surveys on, on post occupancy evaluations after flipping the spaces. Are, sorry, do you do you hear the same background noise as I heard myself now? No. No, I don't know. I started a, a while ago. But uh, in any case, what, what I was mentioning that coming back to the office for many people, it's it's based in in interaction and, and, and collaboration and, and finding people or finding peers. But that does not necessarily in many cases uh, has to be your own team because your own team can be located everywhere in the world or in other locations like like it happens to me. If I have the option to go to an office, it's basically to to feel to find this connection that at home virtually in two dimensions you cannot do and and that it's very difficult to measure in terms of experience in terms of data analytics so we've been struggling during during months and months in thinking how to measure the performance of our new uh new sites or after done sizing surfaces and how do you measure engagement because you were mentioning, yeah, we, we were we were thinking we, we have a, a, a few a few locations where we, we we have data analytics and we have sensors, not everywhere because when you manage a, a wide portfolio, it's it's a challenge, it's a huge investment, and you need to to decide what you want to measure. But when you move to the why to measure purely occupancy, to try or to pretend to measure uh, user experience that's that's really challenging so how do you measure user experience how do you measure engagement you mentioned a, a, a funny point that uh, uh, close people to me mentioned uh, a while ago uh, that she started a new job in a new company and she was supposed to be in the office what you mentioned no five days a week because was in in training mm -hmm. but on monday and friday the persons who were supposed to train her were at home so she was sitting at the office doing call, team calls and you know what's the point in attending to a place just because it's mandated if there is a purpose so um, I, I believe what all all of us we are struggling is in finding that purpose and that purpose is not going to be a corporate purpose it's going to be completely different depending the the group of team workers you 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 will have depending on the division depending on the individual work and then you will need to define the 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 what the what the the why the who and the when so so the why becomes broader because you have more w's <laughs> introduced in, in in the way yeah. in the in the path of measuring this this user experience i believe and and honestly uh the user experience measure for me measuring the the occupancy of a meeting room when we are developing different ways of collaborating in in, in the open space okay gives me the if i'm doing well or not in the sense of, of downsizing capacities or if i'm lacking uh, in, in in terms of providing certain types of of spaces to, to mm -hmm. the local organization but it's not giving me if that organization is performing well or not or if they and if they are enjoying enough the space no yeah so that's what for me it's the most challenging point nowadays to measure the the ux when it comes to 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 get an outcome if we did it well or not when we shrinked an a space so you can define ratios but where's the limit so so we define certain ratios where after flipping the office and, and uh, everybody was happy new office but 
you saw that the, the occupancy ratios were still low. So what's the outcome? What we could do, we could go further. We, we, we could we could downsize double than what we did. So, yeah. Yeah. No. It's but, it's interesting. It's interesting when you're talking about uh, well, sort of a combination of, of both Stacy, what you've said, and, and Jordy, what you've shared as well is you know there still continues to be a lot of focus on figuring out you know how to bring everyone back right? Versus mm -hmm. focusing on the people that are actually demonstrating a dependency of some kind on the physical office space and designing that space to meet their specific needs. And so we're sort of casting this wide net to try to bring as many people back as we possibly can and using all the excuses or sort of the reasons to bring them back, which are not really founded in anything versus saying, okay, we've had two or three years of, you know, some level of dependency on office space, be it 30%, 40%, whatever it is for the organization. Why not dig into that specific data to learn about the behaviors of the people that are coming into the office and what has changed in terms of how they're interacting with the physical space. There seems, like I said, it's, there's the focus on trying to increase the numbers which has failed miserably because it's like, it hasn't really worked. I mean, we've made some strides, but again, when we're comparing data, again, in the benchmark report um, that we've just completed, you know, to January of 2022, where we see 140% increase in terms of change. Well, yeah, in January, we were still going through Omicron, but by the time, you know, March rolls around, you know, that tapers off significantly and suddenly, there really isn't that much of a change year over year in terms of how many people are physically returning to the office, regardless of the mandates that are occurring. And so this leads me now to the next question where we think about, you know, the, the role of data and the purpose that data plays in corporate real estate and how, like, should we be looking to data to actually shape the goal, right? Of what is the role of real estate is it something that you just pull out of the sky or is there real tangible opportunity looking at the various data sources that you can have within your organization? Because a lot of organizations don't have sensor data, but there still is plenty of data within an organization that you can tap into to get a sense of what are the needs? What are these new emerging behaviors and patterns that are occurring within the workplace relative to the people who are actually coming in and using using this space. So Jordi, I know that you guys have done a major transformation across your portfolio globally. Can you maybe share with us what you guys have done within your organization uh, from a data perspective? Well, from a data perspective, I would say that we we didn't have that many data when we entered in our, in our, in our next normal office concept or, and, and the way to, to reshape the the real estate for, for portfolio for the future so basically because when we we started the not the experiment but what we were in in completely experimental mode when when we were in 2020 2020 2021 and we we decided to to start defining defining some ratios and defining the the future purpose or repurpose of of the office we cannot hide or we cannot deny that that the the downsizing of our portfolio had um initially a major cost opportunity driven um goal because all organizations saw a, an opportunity to downsize the portfolio and an opportunity to 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 reduce real estate costs but as soon the the three years from from 2020 progressed the organization and i think many other organizations saw the opportunity of 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 providing a new workplace experience because the the employee was expecting something different to be offered by the organization to come back so the simply the mandates we saw countries and we saw other organizations mandating where we had or where they had internal fights between departments between human resources that 
or between certain divisions that they wanted a certain behavior, but the employees didn't want. And then who wants to be the bad cop here? Who wants to disengage the employee? Who wants to harm the talent management? Or to, who wants to, to, to simply uh, not give the, uh, the opportunity to an employee that was hired during the pandemic and was living or is living 600, 600 kilometers away <laughs> from that location? And we gave him or her that that opportunity to to enroll our organization know what you you simply get rid of that person or or you continue you know offering him or her an opportunity to 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 continue being part of this organization so that it's when you start redefining the the type of persons that should come to the to an office or not and i believe and i believe you mentioned well we mentioned talent the 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 initial decision i think was cost contention because all organizations was were struggling and ours were was not an exception but uh after that we are understanding that offering the proper user experience is the one we it's what we want to keep that engagement and to keep the the most performing the better the most performing team possible but at the same time we found with data other opportunities to to optimize the way we manage real estate like for instance for facility management um facility, man facility management i am talking not about not just about energy consumptions and and the esg footprint of our organizations i'm talking also about catering services cleaning services, maintenance services. So how do we entry in a world of data management that can enable some sort of dynamic facility management? And how do we use that data to provide the most efficient or the most uh, attractive user experience for the employee? If you come to an office on Friday and that office is completely empty, and you have some sort of sense of uh, caring for for the planet and you see that <laughs> everything is working the six floors in the building are working is heated or it's air conditioned there is five percent occupancy that day in the office and and then you see the message of the, that your organization is caring for the planet that has an asg speech but it's not co you know, it's not, yeah. it's completely misaligned. Yeah, I think uh, in, in, in cases where I have clients, and I'll give you one example, where the issue of engagement is really primary, and you mentioned that, Jordi, and you asked about it, Sandra, the, the issue of engagement and how to measure it becomes really paramount. There are better ways to measure engagement, but it is, in a sense, divorced a little bit from the workplace in the sense that engagement doesn't necessitate somebody being in any particular place you can be engaged with your organization very you know in a very robust and good way and not really spend a lot of time physically in a place um, that is provided by that organization and as jordy mentioned um it's it's become an issue where people are dispersed and they're dispersed in, in large organizations that are global. They're dispersed even in mid-size organizations where they might have national offices um, and multiple offices. And so they're not necessarily together anyway, even prior to COVID, they weren't always together. So the question of engagement is really a much bigger issue than it is well about being together. So the argument um, that is provided by leadership, which is we want to come together so we can collaborate, we want to be together so that we can build loyalty and we can build uh, strong relationships is actually not a very strong one considering the way organizations are structured now. And what brings people together and engaged is a bigger question, but it's also a question about how dependent and we have become and how very good we have become at using technology because yeah. over COVID, the technology took over. Prior to, to COVID, we didn't spend all our time in virtual meetings and webinars and all kinds of online uh, 
uh, capabilities. But now we are, and we're very capable of in, in that area. And so therefore, measuring engagement and measuring networking and measuring collaboration is much broader than are we physically in a place. And so organizations have the power to measure some of that. Many do have that data. They just don't necessarily look at it very closely to understand what it's meaning. And we can even network who people are talking to if we choose to do that, um, not in a, in a you know, prying way, but just in a, in a knowledge way. So are people really developing relationships across boundaries? And I think that that is a big issue that's happening um, that, that companies could dive into a little bit, which would help them understand a little bit about the engagement level, the relationship building, the way people are collaborating. Brings, to the, brings us to the point that you made, Sandra, which is that the data is actually showing that people are spending time in a meeting room or in a room in an office all by themselves in many cases. And part of the reason is, is because they are not collaborating in person, but they are yeah. collaborating. And the other reason is, is because people have become habituated to working in a sort of quiet space now. We've been at home a lot of years and we became habituated to being in a space that's quite quiet and on our own. And that actually has worked for a lot of people and they are actually comfortable working that way. So when they come to the office, they're looking for a place that they can replicate their environment from home and finding those quiet corners, those quiet spaces. But yet we're actually building office spaces and we, renewing office spaces that are featuring the idea of being physically together in collaborative spaces. And in a way it could be, not necessarily, but it could be counter to what people really need and want. So I think the whole idea of measuring what is happening in an office is really critical. I think what is happening there is deeper than just looking at, okay, are our rooms being used? Well, if your rooms are being used, that's one piece of information. How they're being used is another very important piece of information. How many people are using those rooms is another piece of information. And then the other pieces of information that are very valuable is perception. The perception of what people are doing. What do they perceive they need? What do they perceive works for them? What do they perceive the organization is doing to support them? Do they actually think things are working? Now, whether they think things are working is a very important piece of information, even if it isn't always exactly accurate. So what we understand many in many cases is that when we measure ut utilization, people can often say, oh, I'm at my desk 40, 50, 60% of the day. When we actually look at the utilization figures, if we have them, we find that they're not at their desk 40, 50, 60% of the day, they're actually at their desk 20% of the day, mm -hmm. sometimes less, sometimes a little more, but often not usually that align with what their perception of what they do is. And that's very important information because it tells us that perception and reality are different and that we have to take both things into account when we actually plan on what offices and spaces should do. And we have to actually help people understand their behavior and what it means, not just physically change space. So in other words, we have to actually learn um, as in, as users, what are we actually doing and why are we doing it this way? And is it working well for us? And we have to, some, in some cases, use change management and maybe many cases use change management to help people learn about their behaviors, maybe change their behaviors to be more appropriate for their needs. So in other words, if I'm sitting at a desk all day trying to concentrate in a huge sea of people, um, it may be better for me to be working in a space that's quieter, maybe fewer people, maybe in a, in a different kind of environment. Um, and I need to learn how to behave differently in the space that's provided. And if those spaces aren't provided, that's where the organization has an opportunity, mm -hmm. right? So we have a lot of opportunity. I think we're missing a lot of those opportunities, I think, because we're actually not looking at the data across what it's telling us. Yeah, yeah. There's so many different data points to look at and to provide a rich response that actually has real meaning. Yeah. I think the other thing too is you're talking about um, you know, the uh the the data and just kind of 
you know, why certain people might be in, uh, you know, working in rooms by themselves or just the behaviors in general. I think the other big reason apart from habit is, you know, the fact that the whole concept of work has changed. So how we worked before we all got sent home because of COVID coming back into the workplace, as you pointed out, is now we're, we're all using technology. You've got, you know, various types of interactions that are occurring where you could be working literally by yourself. So you're not, you know, collaborating with anyone virtually, or you could be in a room by yourself, but working with other people that are, you know, fully remote. You could also be the on the other side of the spectrum where you're working with other people in the office. So face to face, so 100% in person or any combination thereof. I've heard from conversations that I've had with people who have been mandated to go back to the office two, three, whatever number of days a week. The biggest challenge from a um, is sort of the, you know, the, the way that we work um, and that they've noticed as a change is how you transition from the in-person face-to-face meeting. Like think about our calendars, right? Is, mm-hmm. is that when you're at home, you go from this meeting to the next meeting to the next meeting, and you can just switch because you're just, you know, you're virtual. But when you're now blending the in-person interaction that might be in a meeting room setting, and you have another call where you're going to be working solo, but with people that are located virtually, the ability to transition into that kind of space with very little friction is problematic because you have time, right? You gotta, you gotta move quickly. It's not like you just switch off one screen and go on to another. You actually have to pick up and move to another location where you're not gonna be disruptive. And some people say, well, you can you know, book the space, but sometimes booking doesn't work because you've got meetings that are scheduled, but then there's also meetings that happen that are ad hoc. You've gotta you know, have a conversation with someone or whatever. And so you're looking for that kind of space. And so the convenience of just parking yourself somewhere and having the privacy to basically do like what you would do, where if there are in-person meetings, they come to you versus, and again, because of the fact that we're seeing that they're only two or three people at most, I mean, there's still large meetings that occur, but there, there's a very, very small percentage of those, is to say that dynamic is easier than having to require the person to pack up their stuff and move to go somewhere else, when in fact that room's probably not gonna be used by someone else anyway, right? So that's one of the things that that um, I think is really interesting is, is that we've never really thought about flow from the standpoint of how people are transitioning because meetings were in person, hmm. right? You didn't have that combination of virtual and in person. And that's really, really hard to replicate in an in-office setting. It's the same thing when you think about, and again, I've done this personally in the past, where you look at, you, you plan to go to the office and you look at your schedule and you think, okay, I've got a, a whack of back-to-back meetings and I've got this one in-person meeting. Maybe it's better if I just have that call virtually because of all the other stuff that's happening for me during the day. Versus if you've only got that one face-to-face meeting, it's easier to then just go to the office and use that day to basically have that in-person experience and do other other things. It's only when you blend the two that it becomes really, really complex. And so I think this is really, again, is where data really comes into play in terms of understanding not only, you know, what we're all focused on, which is, you know, how many bums in the seats, you know, what is the utilization of space as it relates to time? What does that translate to in terms of sharing ratios? But I think going beyond that is to say, well, where are people coming from and where are they going to as they're moving around within the office? And so there's kind of a, a bit of a real time element that comes, you know, that bubbles up when you start to think about how we need to start measuring workspace, not necessarily where you're measuring people, but looking at the behaviors and that, that transition kind of activity that's occurring to really enable you to understand where are people going? Like, what are the preferences for space? You said also the fact of the change management piece, which is absolutely true. 
But I always make reference to a, a comment that was made. I was at an IFMA show a couple of years back, and I don't remember the name of the architect that was on stage, but he made a comment that really struck me where he was talking about a, a specific um, customer um, case study um, where he said, you know, you're in the midst of the pandemic. There's only maybe, you know, less than 10 percent of people in the office. And he says, and you just watch where what people actually do. And he's like the the actual, you know, natural behavior of people tells you something about the nature of people. Right. And so it, we have an opportunity now where you're not planning for you know, a uh, hundred or a thousand people, you're planning for, well, it could be a hundred. You're, you're not planning for a hundred percent, basically. You're planning for, you know, maybe 25 mm -hmm. to 30%. And so it gives you the opportunity to, if you want to keep that 30% coming to the office is plan the space based on what people are gravitating towards. What are their preferences? Because if that's what makes them happy, if that's what allows them to work their best, why go against the grain? Right. Like we talk about change management before because we were trying to densify space and trying to change the behaviors because you needed to bring more people into the space. Now, however, you've got something completely opposite happening. You know, you want to be able to maintain some kind of level of pres presence. Jordi, as you were talking about, you know, um, the need for, you know, maintaining culture and kind of what does the office space, you know, represent to the employees or to your, you know, your external um, customers and, and vendors and partners. Uh, this is an opportunity to basically think about what is the role of corporate real estate when you start to think about the office and what that new role is going to be going forward with the fact that you might have only 25, 30 percent of your workforce coming through that space on a rotational basis because it's not necessarily always the same 20 or 30 percent. Mm -hmm. But knowing that, OK, you have to accommodate the needs of that percentage of people but then you also have an opportunity to basically demonstrate what role that real estate is playing for your organization and how that message comes across. As Jordi, you were talking about, you know, ESG and operating expenses and ensuring that you're aligning based on what you're saying, you know, to the outside world and what you're actually what you're actually doing. Right. If you if you allow me, uh, I think our role for sure it's it's to continue right, right sizing the portfolio in the future but mm, we need to become more enablers of the of the workplace experience uh, for the employee so we need to to be the the, spar the the sparring partners of hr in in provide this this uh this user experience and basically to enable uh the capacity of a chart to retain and to and, and to and to achieve this loyalty of the employee we we mentioned we mentioned uh we mentioned about the diversity coming at, at work the the we are conducting some experiments because the finally the way of work has has changed in in the sense that we we are tackling more diverse uh, diverse works or ways of working. If I look into myself, how I was working before the pandemic, I'm home, how I'm working now, and what are my expectations when I go to an office? And you try to measure me when I go to an office. You won't find me in a workstation, jamais. You won't find me never in a workstation. Because basically, if I go to an office once every other month or once every two months, I won't spend a minute probably to leave a jacket but i won't use that workstation in a entire day because i will i will spend my agenda will be connecting i spent three weeks in germany um three months ago and those weeks were basically connecting people so sitting at my desk was 20 minutes or half an hour between meeting and meeting because the purpose was connecting and engaging and making bonds and making connections for the future so so that will depend. This diversity will define the types of uses you will find in, in your in your office, depending the type of employee that comes. If it's if it's the one that comes recurrently, four days a week, for sure you will be able to define some patterns. But if it's not, if it's an employee that, has, as I mentioned, was hired during the pandemic and is living 500 kilometers away, the day that goes to the office once a month that day for him it's meeting 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 and not necessarily using meeting rooms 
<laughs> can be meeting in sure. the in, in the coffee in the pantry so so as we became more decentralized and when we consequently we became more tech dependent also the leaders have develop the the need to lead more digitally my manager my my actual manager is sitting in germany and 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 i have an, another another manager that is she's sitting in in mississauga so i i so they they are they are they are well they need it i believe they need it because because previously prior prior to the pandemic the majority of managers were leading teams, local teams, or teams that were not necessarily that far away. But now we are, we are, yeah, leading teams that are uh, a bunch of hours uh, away, and we see colleagues that are not necessarily sitting in the headquarters, sitting in Toronto, taking care of uh, of uh, communication, global communication roles. And I, I believe. Now we are conducting a, a VR experiment in, in in real estate, and we we started to because we we mentioned change management, no, and I I believe we we have a, a window a real window of opportunity for corporate real estate when it comes to change management and to and to speed up the decision making process of changing the spaces, in in and we started working with digital twins. We started. Uh, I'm onboarding people in the in the use of the metaverse, wow. and you cannot believe how fast can be convincing an, an, a local organization of moving into a new location using this way of, of so immersing them in the future location they will have in nine months from now. Uh, in in some cases, you 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 saw you saw you convince them. Well, with with a bunch of objections during during the call, but in a single in a single in a single session, they were able to compare two different two different options of of uh, future offices. They decided, and in a single morning, they had yeah the decision was taken. So when when uh, I leave myself, when when before the pandemic, we started doing office transformations. Um, the change management process was something that lasted for months, and we had tons of interviews, tons of surveys. And nowadays, you can, you can, as a real estate uh, organization, you can speed up using technology precisely, something that we couldn't expect before. No. Jody, I have a question for you. Sorry, mm -hmm. uh, just a quick question. Um, mm -hmm. As you're talking about uh, VR uh, and sort of, you know, how you're immersing people in that world to make decisions about, it sounds as though, you know, a future physical location, why yeah. not stay in VR? Like why not build out space in VR, like that's an what office I, space, that, right? That's what I wanted to, to say. We are developing, we are developing digital twins for the sake of transforming future physical organizations, but we are also developing virtual locations where we can meet for onboarding purposes, for tracing in hazardous, hazardous materials or hazardous procedures that cannot be replicated in the physio physical world without mm -hmm. uh, facing risks, right. for engaging, for and now we are trying to experiment about uh, DEI, basically neuro neurodiversity at work, uh, building relaxation rooms in, in VR and finding a place where to gather with colleagues scattered all across Canada, which is going to be interesting because it's people sitting in, in several locations, but they are participating from, from uh, basically volunteering groups that are working for, for the non-visible disabilities. And I believe we have an opportunity here as a real, real estate department that could be probably something that more IT related but uh, as we were leading the, the organization in, in providing audiovisuals to, to our workplace, we, we started experimenting on that. Nowadays, we have a team of 60 people across the world. And uh, yeah, we have more than 20 countries that are wow. pretending to, to experiment with this. And, and Canada is one of the ones that we are yeah, pretending to lead it because we have the, the biggest amount of devices nowadays. And um, yeah, I believe in four years from now, even I, I don't expect waiting for too long. There is a lot of a skepticism 
I said it right. Skepticism. Skepticism. Yeah. 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 Uh, in the in the VR world, but we saw competitors and other companies using, I believe, more in the augmented reality than in full immersive worlds where you disconnect completely because the the difficulty of yeah, you you you, you finally get a, a headache. Yeah. But <laughs> but uh, I but it's something that you train your mind. And and as I started with twenty minutes, now I can handle more than an hour and a half. And I. Uh, we conducted uh, workshops in, in Sao Paulo with people sitting in our room in Sao Paulo and others sitting in Germany, Lisbon and Canada. And honestly, after 10 minutes, you completely disconnect that if the, coll the colleagues sitting next to you, it's 5,000 kilometers away. Wow. <laughs> and it's something that it's, for me, it's, it's mind blowing. And, and uh, using, for instance, uh, Matterport or 360 tools that, uh, that is a static picture um but uh showing a space that you recently transformed in melbourne to a colleague that is facing the same change management issue in colombia or in toronto mm. and showing them yeah the space completely immersing immersing them in the in the in the reality it's it's gonna be it's gonna be game, game changer and there are other companies that are already doing uh, I don't know if you have heard about Avatur. There are many of them, but it, it's it's if Matterport is an aesthetic picture, picture Avatur nowadays it's 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 a completely 360 degrees uh, virtual call online where you can visit the space. I could entry in your room, I could move the mouse and decide what I want to see from your room. So that's game changing for, for people who is participating uh, in a workshop where some colleagues are sitting in Toronto and some others are in Vancouver. But you can experience the space wow. in, in VR like you if you would be there. No, So I think real estate will, will have a huge transformation in the way we become hybrid, but hy hybrid not commuting from home to the office. So hybrid in the sense we use the technology in the in the future and how do we enable our organizations to become real hybrid so because we cannot deny i'm sorry i'm extending a little bit but we cannot deny that we have native digitals coming to our workforce and that in four or five years they will be 50 percent of our workforce yes. so generation z i i i allowed my son to to wear the the glasses for a for a beat uh, some days ago in two minutes three four minutes he was managing himself without no need of training so when we conduct those trainings we usually spend one hour with the employee to to explain him how to move around the virtual real estate space or the virtual office no so that's going to be game changing in, 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 a, in a matter of three, four, five years, just because the capacity to, to connect with the new workforce will be f way faster than, than it is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's sort of, it's fascinating what you're talking about. And I think that there's a lot of truth to it because the behavior that we're seeing people engaging in now, when people are using one person in a meeting room, to actually sit in a meeting that might have 10 people in it, but they're all dispersed, is a statement about what people prefer to do. Because even when you're in an office and five of the 10 people are in that office, we're still sitting you know, on our own computer. We're, yeah. men, in many cases, I, I have clients who are actually concerned about the fact that if a meeting is called and you are actually in an office and five of you are there, you're still not choosing to get together in a room together you're still on your computer, goes back to the comment that you made, um, Sandra, about the way that people are, are using their technology but and their preference, but also that whole thing about transitioning from one meeting to another and the flow of activity, because it is much easier to stay on your computer and have a meeting um, with 10 people, even if, if several of them could be together in the same space, and then there is the issue of equity, because in a meeting where it's a hybrid meeting and five people are in a meeting room together and five people are dispersed, there is an issue of equity, how to run that meeting so that all people are in 
on, on an equal footing, can equally join, can equally participate, equally read each other's you know body language and all of those other issues, it, it becomes an issue. And the equity is an issue because it's often the case that those who are remote are not participating in the same way that those are in the same room. And how many of you may have experienced that there's all th these offline conversations that are happening with two or three people in a room can't really be properly heard by the people that are online. And then the people online disengage and suddenly you see that their videos turned off and, you know, and they're, and they're on mute and it's because they're disengaged in that meeting. So this is the kind of behavior that we're seeing and we're having to deal with that behavior. And we talked about change management. Well, change management, one of the benefits of using change management really well is not just to change people's behaviors to say, okay, this is what we want them to do. So we're going to make them change. That, that really isn't the purpose ultimately. The purpose is to identify barriers, risks, problems in advance of them happening um, and, and embedding themselves and, and having bad behaviors as a result. And so what you do is you actually identify those barriers, those problems, those risks, and you manage them effectively. And sometimes the recommendations or solutions are surprising. So for example, I had a client recently who had a strategy, they were trying to roll it out. It was a hybrid strategy and they were also making a major um, headquarters move. And there was a discovery through the change management program, which was actually undertaken early enough to identify that there was resistance for managers to carry out leadership's mandate to come back to the office three days a week. Now, this resistance to, on the part of management was a real barrier to succeeding in rolling out this strategy, clearly. And the reason when discussed with these managers one-to-one um, -one became evident. The pattern was very obvious that these managers were saying uh, that our teams are motivated to right now. They're doing well. They're being productive. They were partially on commission. They are actually doing extremely well with their work. We do not want to demotivate our staff by insisting we follow through with the mandate that the leadership or our putting on us because we know that will demo demotivate our staff and we can't have that. We can't demotivate our staff. So they were actually making, you know, intentional choices in how they were managing their staff and making the decision not to demand that these people come to the office when they didn't want to or were resisting and trying to, in a way, create a certain amount of autonomy within the team for saying, how do we as a team want to operate that works for us well and let's agree what that should look like and let's do that because that way I'm not going to demotivate you. And that way we can actually get the better behaviors that we're looking for rather than the ones that we don't want yeah. and nobody will agree to. And so it became uh, an issue of learning about where the barriers sat and figuring out what the solutions could look like. And then in a way the change management was upward. How to, uh, how, for, how to help leadership understand what was going on in their organization, which they didn't really know, and then to help them understand how to make changes to their strategy that could align with the best outcomes for their business. Business, right. And, and this, was, this was, is not uncommon. This is what we're seeing a lot of. And the AI story and all that's happening in there is part of the solution. And it's going to become more and more part of the solution. And as Jordi is pointing out, all the opportunities that are there and, and will support us, and we could build into our solutions when we discover where the barriers sit, where the problems are, what do we have to design or solve for, and then use these technologies to support it. Yeah. And the data is going to help us. Absolutely. Right? We, we definitely need to have that data, but we also need to find out where those barriers sit. Yeah, and where for the sure. problems are. For sure. And change management becomes part of the solution. What are the recommendations to, you know, take it out of the way of, of being a productive organization? We have a question uh, from uh, from the yeah. audience. What I uh, yeah, from mm -hmm. uh, Beatrice. So the question mm -hmm. is for an organization with a wide range of activities and roles, many with in person operational requirements, where would you prioritize spend to meet modern day employee expectations? virtual and technology or physical spaces and why? 
Mm-hmm. I have an opinion. Well, I, I think we, 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 we discussed about that and how the future workforce will, will evolve. And I believe it's not prioritizing. That would depend on the role and that would depend on the, the finally on, on the, on with whom this person connects, if it's connecting locally or has all the team local, uh, then probably it's not a matter of prioritizing it will be 50, 50. If this person has a more global role or more regional role, probably he will be, he will tend more, more to be virtual. But <clears throat> I wanted to mention that the finally, uh, we haven't talked about AI and how that will transform the way we speed up and we, and we work and we do some some sort of tasks that will basically disappear or will be minimized in the future and that will a- allow us probably to collaborate in different ways that we haven't explored yet or we will be or we will have probably we, we mentioned the metaverse no the one of the main div- difficulties of the metaverse probably with ai will be solved so having having uh, virtual assistants or having bots or being able to digitalize ourselves in a more real manner. I have seen recently uh, broadcasted an interview with an MIT, an M- MIT scientist with, uh, with Mark Zuckerberg that was really <laughs> mind blowing, really mind blowing. And if that is going to happen in three, four, five years, we will be able to see virtually ourselves in a, re- in a virtual world with 90% uh, equal as our real face is, which is that's that's going to transform the way we work that doesn't doesn't means that we'll will be more tent or prompt to work virtually so so i i believe i will continue having needs to socialize because human being is a social person and yeah. we will need to to gather and to but the 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 way we'll use the space will completely different and probably we will not pay attention anymore if if we are using 30% the meeting room or 20% the workstation so basically you will you will try to be the most efficient for your your uh, your net zero strategies or your carbon emission strategies or your ESG strategy for the future and you will finally focus on getting data of your operations in order to to ensure that your operations are the the most sustainable or sustainable aligned in 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 the way real estate provides for the organization for for that know that we haven't had time enough to talk about about data analytics uh and and well and climate climate change and or risk we need to do another <laughs> session on that <laughs> we require another session for that but that i believe i believe we can provide lots of with data analytics we can provide lots of opportunities for the social part of the esg that yeah. it's also talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. We we talked about this, and I believe the overall the data will be much more focused in in you in providing the right user experience and and, and employee fidelity and, and method. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Stacy, so did you? Yeah. So we touched on Beatrice's question a little bit because I think that you know one of the examples of that kind of question, which is prioritizing the spend. Um, and employees' expectations virtually or physically. And, and what about those people who can't do their jobs virtually? They actually have to do them physically in a space, you know, bus drivers, and, you know, utility operators and things like that. And the, many of these environments are actually unionized as well. So union, unionized environments are a little more complex as well. And we, we work in quite a few of those. And so we are aware of those issues and they are issues of equity as well as issues of a sense or a perception of privilege versus non-privilege and these are issues that come up quite a lot in these environments so it is important to solve for these and some of the solutions are sometimes surprising um they're they're turning from hybrid towards maybe four day week or or short days or shorter hours or other other solutions that everybody can benefit from rather than the few. And so there are solutions out there for those environments where there are a mix of of employees, some operational and in the field, so to speak, and those who are actually office-based and can work more virtually. And those organizations have different set of issues 
and actually have to manage those issues accordingly. And there are solutions for those. And they're not always the same issues as organizations where 90% of their employees can, can, can work virtually and are very dispersed. So we have to be aware of the fact that there are differences out there and Absolutely. they need different solutions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think just as a final point, as we're wrapping up here is, you know, when you think about everything that's going on, going back to the first question around, you know, what is the role of real estate for the organization? I think that's really the determining factor. Sometimes it feels like what we're seeing may be a precursor for what's to come. And so it's still very questionable in terms of, you know, is it going to go back to, you know, dependency of space? Is it going to be more moving towards VR and kind of the virtual world, which kind of feels like that's the direction we're going in as we continue to evolve from a technology point of view, from a work point of view, just kind of, and even just from a people perspective as well. Um, so that's all, you know, I guess to, you know, to be continued to be seen in terms of what's going to happen in the, mm -hmm. in the future. So um, thank you again, uh, Stacy and Jordy for your time and to everyone that joined us today. This is a, a, a great conversation and uh, hopefully there'll be uh, another one to continue on the conversation around the use of analytics, as Jordi pointed out, with respect to ESG and other things that are uh, increasingly important that goes beyond the physical um, space. So thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks. Bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.